Hola, I'm Dr. Ramon Martinez. Thank you for visiting my YouTube channel, RJ Martinez. This channel has videos related to the California period of our state before the Americans. It has videos about the development of El Pueblo de San Jose into a modern American city. And part of that development was the civil rights movement in the 50s, 60s, and 70s by the Mexicans, Mexican Americans and Chicanos of the town. One of the best records of the everyday life of the Mexican people is a small magazine called El Excentrico. El Excentrico was published from 1946 until 1976 by Humberto Garcia and his son, Bert. The magazine has lots of information about the social, cultural, and political life of the Mexican people. Our first series will begin with discussions with Dr. Gregorio Mora Torres, who is a lecturer at San Jose State University and one of the best informed persons on the Mexican history of San Jose. This is Ramon Martinez. Good afternoon. It's Friday, July 11, 2014, and we're sitting near San Jose State speaking with Professor Gregorio Mora Torres. And he's um, going to talk to us a little bit about El Excentrico magazine. El Excentrico magazine was started by a Tejano from Texas, uh, a printer who came out of El Paso. A uh, guy by the name of Garcia, and um, he came in 1947. And as a way of uh, trying to start off a business, of it, he decided to become a printer. But he found out that the, the community needed a newspaper, uh, a magazine. So he came out with this little nice magazine that he called El Excentrico. And El Excentrico kind of reflects a little bit about who he is, uh, an eccentric figure. And so he wanted to combine his magazine with a uh, uh, a lot of gossip, uh, a lot of community news, uh, but he also wanted to, 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 to attract business, and so he would sell people um, ads in the, uh, in the magazine to make money. As you can see, uh, you know, the, the, one of the biggest uh, businesses was this, you know, the musicians, so they, they would have a, a weekly magazine, weekly dances, and so here's a, an ad about who is coming to, to, to dance, to the dances in San Jose. Okay, and um, Frank Davila was the biggest uh, entrepreneur, dance entrepreneur. He he, was, he, he owned uh, the local theater, which he will also advertise every every by every two weeks. You know, uh, you will have the regular showings, and you can see that uh, El Teatro Liberty was the place where every Mexican used to go every weekend to see uh, movies from uh, uh, Pedro Infante uh, to Cantin Flans, and so he would attract that. Uh, it's also interesting that he also uh, would sell space to local small businesses. For example, you have uh, you know, appliances. You would have mechanics. Um, and then you have uh, clothing stores, and all of those uh, clothing stores are, you know, basically companies that attracted, uh, uh, you know, Mexicanos from the Colonia. Every uh, issue also had a invited columnist, okay, and so you have the big uh, groups like American Jeff Forum. 
uh, CSO. Uh, there are some social groups that are also there, and so you, they will also have the periodic, their weekly or the bi-weekly columns. And so this one is uh, from the GI Forum, and obviously it deals with the uh, with the uh, matters that are important to veterans. Uh, the Mexicano community also had a uh, big events, and so this is Daniel Saldana, who was one of the the, the leading. Uh, uh, columnist, he's a Mexicano from Mexico City, uh, and he was more concerned with, uh, with with promoting culture. Very conservative individual, but he's he's publishing. Um, it is important for people to also know about uh, you know contemporary news. So there's there's another columnist that talks about contemporary news, what's happening in the community. And so it is through this eccentrico that uh, you get uh, local news. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the uh, eccentrico has some letters to the editor or some poetry. And, uh, and this is where you, where you get enough information for people about politics or whatever they should bother them. Okay. This issue of El Eccentrico is dated February the 3rd, 1963. And it, it is really one of those interesting little pieces of, a, of a local history. Uh, it is uh, an issue that focuses on David Sierra, who was a longtime uh, columnist for El Eccentrico, but he also has uh, the interest in writing novels, and what this might be uh, interesting to tell is that in, 19, in 1959, uh, there was another local author by the name of Jose Antonio Villarreal, who wrote a famous uh, book, a famous novel, called Pocho, and he always claimed that Pocho was the first Chicano literature, piece of Chicano literature. In fact, David Sierra might be challenging him because he, David Sierra is thinking about writing a novel that deals with, with, uh, with detective stories. And so he, he's, he's, you know, he's got the makings of a, of, a, of a writer. Nobody really knows, you know, how many books he wrote, but uh, it'll be interesting to follow him and, and find out if he ever wrote a novels that were long term pieces. One of the uh, things that is common in the 1950s, uh, 1940s, is the fact that San Jose probably has about, it's a small city, about 60,000 people in San Jose, 1940s, 1950s. And 30% of, of these people are Mexicanos. People that have been here for a long time, since 1777. Recent immigrants that have come from Texas, Arizona. A lot of migrants. In this uh, episode, we're going to be talking about the Mexicanos of the community. Uh, there has been a, there's a lot of history here of Mexicanos. Uh, San Jose was founded by Mexicanos in 1777, and it has always had a large population of Mexicans. Uh, by 1950, San Jose is still a very small city, so essentially agricultural. Uh, there's about 60,000, maybe 70,000 people in San Jose. Uh, about 30% or about, you know, 15, 20,000 are Mexicano. Uh, and, and most of them are working in our culture. They live essentially all over the, all over the city. Some of them are urbanites. They live in, in, in the actual city. But a lot of them are working out in the fields. A lot of our migrants are coming from Texas, are coming from Mexico, are coming from New Mexico, are coming from Arizona. Uh, some of them are coming from the, from the, from, uh, the great from the Central Valley here or from Southern California anyway these are people that are working every day every day in and out uh, long hours and so on weekends you know they, they spend uh, you know Sundays going to mass and so a lot of them used to come downtown to, to mass eventually they would go and as a family they would go eat at the local restaurants and then towards the evening they will end up going to El Teatro Liberty and this is like a, a, a family event. 
uh, people went there to see the latest Mexican films that are coming from Mexico. And they will listen to, they will go see uh, movies from uh, leading Mexican stars like Pedro Infante, uh, uh, Jorge Negrete. Sometimes, uh, you know, you know, Piporro is another one. Cantinflas is another uh, another actor that comes out a lot, a lot. And so you have people from San Milpitas, from East San Jose, from downtown who walk from their homes to, to, the, to, the, to the Liberty, Liberty Theater. Uh, sometimes they come from Campbell, sometimes they come from Gilroy, Mountainville, uh, Sunnyvale. And so they all congregate. And this is where the people meet after the movies. It, uh, boyfriends meet their girlfriends, friends uh, you know, meet the compadres and comadres. Uh, and so it's, it's a place that, that the Theater to Liberty is a place where people socialize, where people come together as friends, as relatives and they really enjoy the movies. And so this is something that was done every week. The Teatro Libert is packed every weekend, you know, uh, you know, Sunday, Monday. And this is the place to be if you want to be seen in San Jose. Do we know who owned the Teatro Liberty? Uh, the Teatro Liberty was owned by um, this guy, Frank Davila who is, I think he's really the manager, but he is the one that, uh, that does all the films. But at the same time, he's also an entrepreneur. He's working hard to, uh, to, to bring in musical groups. And so sometimes he will organize it so that Pedro Infante will come in, Piporo will come in and make presentations at the theater. And, and so everybody really enjoys the fact that you know, this great Mexican stars are coming to the little town and really have a good time. Okay. Most people today are simply too young to remember the music of the 1950s, the 1960s. Uh, you know, but there was a time when there were a lot of live bands uh, that were of interest to your dads, perhaps even to your abuelitos, that uh, played kind of interesting music, but to you may be completely strange. In the 1950s, there was this big band music that was very common in the United States and, and they had the same type of music in Latin America and so you have uh, this, this mixtures of, some, of uh, rumba and all kinds of other uh, dance on and dancers and so there's all kinds of interesting music that people were listening here in San Jose and so one of the individuals that I, I think would be interesting to look at is this individual and one of the individuals that is that was very popular here in San Jose it's a local leader a, lo a local band leader was this guy Chris Carmona who, who, who would play from San Jose to Sacramento to Fresno and so he's, he's a craze, uh, he's mixing traditional Mexican music, traditional uh, music from Latin America and combines it with American music, okay? So uh, I think that, uh, you know, individual, we need to go back and listen to individuals like Chris Carmona, uh, other local group leaders like Cani Caudillo who was also very uh, interesting individual, Cali Caudillo, County Caudillo, you know, was, had his own band, 1940s, 1950s, and 1960s. And so, you know, it would be important for us to look at the, the, this old, uh, you know, musical groups that have been a part of San Jose for a long time. In, in today's world, uh, oftentimes we don't think about how much time has gone by and the new technologies that are now, that we forget that 50 years ago, or even before, a little bit after that, there are this huge television sets. And this was something that was very rare for a lot of Mexicanos in the in San Jose. And so everybody wanted, to, in the 1960s, everybody wants to buy a, a, a television set, but it's, they're expensive and not everybody can have one. So here's the business that is, that is advertising that they can sell used televisions for 20 to 50, okay? And that's a lot of money at that point, okay? And so, and so here you have, uh, you know, people buying second-hand products. We don't see that anymore. Here we're doing it, okay? Uh, another story that is also important is the fact that there's a lot of people that have been a part of uh, history in San Jose, Mexican history, that nobody knows, nobody hears about him. And, and, and so there, there's one individual that I'd like you to meet. This guy right here is a guy by the name of Jose Alvarado. And at one time, Jose Alvarado was the most important 
radio disc jockey that existed in 1950s in San Jose. A lot of people loved them, a lot of people listened to him. He would have programs in the morning. He would be playing Mexican music early in the fifth, uh, five thirty in the morning so that he could help. That Mexicano people work, you know, go, go to work. And so he, you could hear Mexicano families listening to radio, to music from him. And as a result of that, he becomes very popular. Well, uh, one of the problems with, uh, with radio is the fact that at that time only, you only had two, three hours of, of, of programming. So uh, this talk has had to do other things. And so what he does is that he set up his own uh, insurance company. Okay, that that uh, that he wants to uh, obviously sell uh, insurance to people, and so that's how he manages to survive by moonlighting as an insurance salesman. Okay, uh, in the 1950s, everybody knows Jose Alvarado. They see him as the leader of the community. Uh, he's involved with the, you know uh, organizing the Cinco de Mayo events. He's a member of uh, La Comisión Honorífica Mexicana, which is uh, the, the, the organization that is, in, that's in, that is looking at raising, uh, at organizing Cinco de Mayo and Six of September events. And he is the unspoken leader for a long time. But next time, we're gonna be looking at the woman that appears right next to him. Her name is Blanca Alvarado, a young Blanca Alvarado, and most people, do not know who she is, but we'll find out who she is because she was also very helpful and very central to the, to the history of the Mejia community in San Jose.